Good morning. Um, dog walk diary. Coach education is a broken series. Um, where are we? Episode five. Episode five. Um, this one is called. Um, oh, we've got a jealous dog. Jealous dog not happy with Flo getting fussed from someone else for their own. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, yes. So, this one is called uh, diversity through decentralisation. Um, now, uh, so one of the things that people recognise about uh, workforce development, this is in sport, but also in all walks of life. Um, is that uh, quite a lot of workforces uh, are not representative of the general population. There's a whole myriad of reasons for that. Um, and not, not necessarily going to prosecute those now. A lot of those are sort of, you know, kind of debated and discussed and there's plenty of space for that kind of conversation. Might even be something I'll come back to later. But the bottom line is that what most people will recognise, and sport is no different, is that there are certain people for whom um, engagement within the workforce is um, a challenge. And the challenge stems from the fact that there are systemic and systematic um, and cultural, but for that, for that for this purpose, we'll talk systematically. Dimensions that actually exclude or make it an unwelcome space, or a, a somewhere, or actively promotes the fact that the workforce isn't necessarily for them. Um, and one of the systemic challenges faced with that. Now, now, just to come back to this point. Now. Some, some people might say, well, hang on a second, why is this important? Why are we, uh, you know, why are we making a big deal out of this? And I would argue that um, it's important for a whole range of reasons. Um, but one of the reasons it's important is because if we genuinely want to grow participation or if we genuinely want to develop talent, then... Having uh, a workforce that understands and has much more of an association. Robert, hello, come this way. Uh, having a workforce that understands and has a, ge a genuine understanding and connection and also, um, uh, you know, comes from uh, the places where, you know, people live, understands the environment and understands the dynamics of that world and some of the challenges that people face when they engage in physical activity or they want to progress through their sporting career. Um, having an understanding of that uh, and having people who are within those environments is really, really powerful. It's often referred to as sort of the, the people like me phenomenon. Um, and there's boatloads of evidence to suggest this, that like, you know, the, the, the people who... Um, you know, who are from at, from an area and within a community and have an understanding of the people in the community uh, are really powerful agents for change. Um, and, and it makes me think about um, uh, somebody I met quite a few years ago now. Um, we were actually on a radio programme together when I was uh, launching a new strategy for coaching and it was quite critical of me um, and in many ways quite rightly because um, a lot of what I was talking about was very, you know, kind of strategic and high level. And it didn't really make, it wasn't really obvious to him, and quite rightly, that it was necessarily going to make any impact on him. Didn't really have much to offer. But I decided to take it upon myself to go and visit him in his environment. He works in a very, um, very sort of deprived area of one of our major cities. And... Um, He's involved in martial arts, coaching martial arts, and actually not just doing amazing things within the community, but also developing some really high-level performers, you know, going on to compete at, you know, national and international level. 
um, from a, you know, a relatively, um, you know, kind of, a, you know, a club environment that, you know, you would never say was, you know, in any way salubrious or got the best of facilities, you know, very, very low cost. The, the subscription model was a almost like an honesty box, you know, pay what you can afford. Um, <clears throat> and I remember one thing, some members of his workforce, you know, they weren't necessarily qualified as such, qualified. And one of the reasons they weren't qualified was because access to the governing body courses, you know, just, just wasn't, it wasn't feasible. And much of the content wasn't relevant to what they were doing in their environment. And some of the members of his workforce had got pretty checkered histories and may not have been able to uh, access the courses for that reason. Now, I'm not going to talk about whether that's right or wrong and whether they should or shouldn't be involved in the workforce. What I'll tell you is that they were involved. They were actively helping out, I think mostly in a voluntary capacity, and they were having an impact on those individuals. Um, so they're members of the workforce, whether the national organisation involved in training and delivery uh, is, you know, is aware or not, they're doing it. And <clears throat> I think one of the challenges with a lot of sports is there's what's referred to as the grey market, which is like uh, all the coaches out there who aren't actually on the radar because they haven't engaged in whatever learning. And various estimates um, place that, and it's different from different sports, but various estimates place that at up to about 50% of coaches don't actually have kind of any formal accreditation. Now, some of that's because they may be operating at the helper level and therefore don't need it. But in other cases, I think it's because they're actively involved, but just haven't, um, you know, kind of gone down that road. So that's interesting in itself. Um, and the, uh, just going back to this story about this particular club, I remember the sort of the guy who was running the club, who was the sort of head coach as well as the you know chair or whatever you call it, basically making the club happen, right, as well as coaching. And sat down and talked to him, talked to me, talked to, to him for about two hours, and I didn't really say much, didn't have much to say. Um, he just talked to me, at me, but that was fine because my job in that situation was really just to be a listener. And actually, it was so instructive and has stayed with me, as you can probably tell, ever since. And the thing he said was, it, if this club didn't exist, there are kids in this club who are from either from different postcodes or they're from different ethnic groups who would be out on those streets and they would be killing each other or trying to. And he said, and the reason they don't do that is because when they come here, I tell them from the get-go, that coming here is a privilege, not a right. And if I find out that you're out there using the stuff that you learn here to injure or attack others, you're never coming back. And he said it's amazingly powerful because that club means, means so much to um, those kids and the people in that club the leaders of that club, the coaches in that club, mean so much to those kids. These are kids often with, you know, very little family support and, you know, very little parental kind of guidance. And these clubs offer that for them. So it's enormously powerful. So anyway, why am I telling this story? Because <clears throat> the people doing that kind of stuff are, like, critical they're critical from participation perspective. They're critical from the fact, the fact that they have a social impact and make a social impact on the world. They're critical because, you know, and it's in, like it's immeasurable. Like, like if you talk about, for example, you know, like crime prevention, things like knife crime, youth violence, these sorts of things. You just think about the sort of social impact and how, you know, how 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 hard is it to calculate the value of that? Because it's a lot of it's done behind the scenes, it's preventative, but these voluntary clubs, largely voluntary, are operating on a shoestring. 
and yet having this impact on society, you know, at a time when, you know, without wanting to get too political, things like, you know, youth service and youth clubs and youth provision have been gutted out of the vast majority of, um, you know, kind of localised provision. And so the voluntary sector and the, what we call the third sector, the charitable sector, steps into that space to then create this kind of opportunities for young people and to sort of do all that, have this sort of social impact. Um, these people are critical for that. And, and they are immensely powerful when it comes to enabling young people to maximise their potential. But what happens, generally speaking, when we talk about that? Well, a lot of that is often very, very systematised. And often when we talk about young people developing their potential, it's about, oh, they must go to this centre or this venue or whatever. Well, that doesn't happen. Because these sorts of people, often with, you know, very, you know, kind of low incomes or whatever it might be, they live in a hyper-local world. And, you know, you could have a leisure centre two miles away, too far away, Right? You know, so the idea of going to some sort of centre, you know, which might be 10, 15, 20, in some cases, hundreds of miles away. And this is the UK, by the way, where hundreds of miles is is really far. <laughs> and so obviously in other countries, that's like a, you know, sort of thing you do on a daily basis to get bread. Um, in the UK, 100 miles away, it's just not going to happen. So workforce, the people in the workforce who are in the community working with those young people and others are enormously impactful from the perspective of participation, from the perspective of social, social impact and from the perspective of talent development. And yet 50% aren't part of the system. They're not being supported. And generally speaking, the way people look at this is to say, oh, we need them to be qualified. Why? Because they need to be insured. They need to do this. They need to do that. All important things. People need to be safe to practice. But actually, we need to flip that round. We need to think about how can we support these people to do the best job possible? They're already probably doing a really good job. I've talked about that previously. We don't know that. <clears throat> It'd be worth finding out. But how do we support them? How do we help them avoid, you know, maybe doing something that might cause others harm, um, you know, unintentionally? How do we help them uh, support young people who have probably got pretty complex needs? We might be able to give them the tools they need to really enable some young person who is facing into some significant challenges, you know, or there may be others we can connect them with. Who would, who would be able to support them. Now, the only way we can achieve that... Oh, and by the way, yes, the only way we can achieve that is to decentralise. So instead of people coming to us, we go to them. Now, that might mean that some of our educational systems we have to let go of. Because many of the organisations involved, the reason they have centralised approaches, or even regionalised approaches, or whatever is because we want control. We want to manage it. We want to make sure that we've got the right level of quality. No, 100% agree with that. Need to maintain quality, of course. But it doesn't mean we have to be the only ones who do it. So what we might want to do is let go of some of the educational stuff. What we might want to do is, um, you know, kind of engage others in community, have more trust, And if we can have a recognition system where actually what we do is we bring people with some expertise and knowledge to those environments to work in those environments with the people in their space and to design learning environments around their needs based on their environment and the people that they're working with, then all of a sudden we can transform everything. And then if we can also design and, and then if we can engage other providers locally who can support that kind of work and support the offer that we provide, then we can have a much greater impact. And the benefit is our workforce, the look of our workforce changes because it becomes more representative of the people that we're trying to, re with the, the people that we're trying to work with. 
So no one should ever use this phrase, and if you hear it, challenge it, that people are hard to reach. They're from hard to reach communities. This is something that I learned, you know, in the last few years, which is these the people, if you ask those people in those communities, they'll say to you, we're not hard to reach. We've always been here. It's the systems and the structures that are created and built, usually in the image of the people who built them, that can't reach. So if we decentralize and work from the ground upwards, and I'm not saying this isn't difficult, of course it is, otherwise we'd be doing it now. But if we can work from the back, from the ground upwards, and there's lots of ways of doing this and there's lots of models and examples of organizations facing into this challenge and having success, a lot of success. And there's already organizations working in a hyper-local way, actually having impact like this. Uh, my good friend, Hannah Crane, who works for Street Games, has a decentralized approach, working on the ground through locally trusted organizations and building up a network of individuals and groups that can provide this kind of opportunity locally. And the fact those examples exist, um, you know, they, you know, that they are a living testament to the fact that this is very doable. It just requires different thinking, working from individual and community backwards rather than system downwards. That's always going to marginalise. Happy to talk to anyone about this in more detail. Happy to share more ideas and more ways of different ways of thinking. At any point, reach out. Um, uh, you know, get in touch with me at, um, on. Uh, you know, via the website, um, talentequation.co.uk. You can reach out to me on a day job basis as well. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, there's, there's some of the organisations that I work with on a daily basis, they can reach out to me as well. Um, but I'm more than happy to speak to any other organisation if they want to try and address this challenge, whether it's within the UK or beyond. Um, and happy to provide some ideas and thoughts and guidance. Likewise, if you are valuing this um, series, please share it helps the podcast grow, helps more people uh, access the learning. You know, some of you might, for example, this resonate and you might want to, you know, kind of share it with your, uh, you know, governing, governing organisation reps or training providers and, you know, kind of give them some ideas or share it with other people who this might resonate with and it means you can take action locally. Um, but that helps the podcast grow and that definitely helps me with managing the costs of uh, running this thing. <laughs> and the time because I've had to invest in some support to help me with that which is great and I'm doing you know you're going to see more of the content more places but um yeah so any help you can do is give me that and you may if you want to if you're a practitioner you want to join the guild which is uh I call it a, ma it's a mastermind group um it's actually a group of a really really intrepid individuals who are really properly facing into some of these conversations and challenges on a regular basis uh we meet monthly we meet on zoom we come together, it's not formal, it's people from all walks of life, all different sports, all different levels, it's very welcoming, it's very open, and everyone's just come with an open mind and a willingness to learn. So um, there you go. Uh, look forward to episode the next episode. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you all have a great time. Speak to you soon, bye.